Greetings and a warm welcome to Bhutan This Week, our weekly news magazine with me, Tashi Yangden. Our top stories of the week. His Majesty the King grants statues for Wang Dezong and Peldin Hamuil Haga in Lunana. Agriculture Department says there will be no shortage of rice this year despite export cap on Indian rice. And Bhutanese judokas focused on Asian Games after Thailand International Judo Championship success. His Majesty the King has granted a bronze de Choku for the Dukang of Wang De Song and the 20 Belden Hamui Corps for the Belden Hamui Lhaga in Tenche Lunana. The Dechuku was installed in the Dukang of the Wang Dezong on 3rd September. The retinue of Peldenhamo was received by the people of Lunana on 1st September and installed in the Lhaga, which was built upon royal command and consecrated in 2018. To enhance the country's health care services, the Health Ministry opened the country's first ever heart centre at the National Referral Hospital in Tempo. His Majesty the Fourth Drukelpo has granted a budget of around 70 million yetam for the centre. The Ministry has plans to upgrade the centre to a cardiology department with more services. The establishment of the heart center at the National Referral Hospital will provide services such as diagnosing and treating heart diseases that do not require significant surgeries. According to a cardiologist at the hospital, the facility will offer a range of treatments, including prevention and treatment of heart attack. Patients who have uh, abnormal heartbeats, who require pacemaker implants, can also be done here. And thirdly, for patients who have congenital heart disease, by birth they have some hole in the heart or who have acquired some kind of valvular heart disease, the valves in the heart that are leaking or stenosed. So those, uh, those valves, those holes in the heart can be closed or the valves can be replaced with minimal invasive surgery. He added that until now, the National Referral Hospital referred 90% of the patients with heart complications abroad for treatment, spending around 1 billion neutrum annually. The health minister said once the center is upgraded to a cardiology department, all kinds of heart surgeries would be performed in the referral hospital. Today, the heart center has one interventional cardiologist and 10 trained nurses. One more cardiologist who is currently undergoing specialist training in Thailand is expected to join the team soon. Namgidim, BBS News. The country's gross domestic product saw a growth of 23 billion yetam in 2022 compared to the previous year. According to a news release from the National Statistics Bureau, GDP rose from a little over 200 billion yetam in 2021 to almost 230 billion last year. The actual GDP growth rate of 5.21% is higher than the Finance Ministry's projection of 4.8% for 2022. Amongst the major economic indicators, the service sector recorded the highest growth of 6.62%, followed by the manufacturing sector at 5.60%. The resumption of tourism in September of last year is largely attributed to growth in the service sector. However, the primary sector saw its growth rate decline to negative 1.15%. As for the share of the economy, the NSV news release states that the service sector accounts for over 50%, followed by the manufacturing sector at over 30%. Meanwhile, the primary sector, which includes agriculture, only contributes about 15% to the overall share of the economy. The news release also states that exports of goods and services declined substantially by negative 8.10%. On the other hand, imports of goods and services increased by over 17% last year. 
The National Statistics Bureau also estimates the GDP per capita income for 2022 to have increased by over 30,000 newtom to a little over 300,000 newtom. GDP per capita income is calculated by dividing a country's GDP by its total population. Sherab Doji, BBS News. Investments in infrastructure rebounded last year following three years of the COVID-19 pandemic-imposed disruptions. According to the National Statistics Bureau's latest national accounts statistics, the country's gross domestic capital formation, which is the investments in infrastructure, grew by almost 30% last year. However, despite the boom in the construction sector, the report shows that the trade deficit has widened to over 78 billion yetum, a whooping 99% increase from 2021. The gross domestic capital formation or GDCF increased from about 20% in 2021 to about 30% last year. Now this means that investments in building or expanding things like factories, machineries and infrastructure like road and bridges and other long lasting assets increased by about 10% last year. According to the National Accounts Statistics, the GDCF, which accounts for over 55% of the gross domestic product of the country, contributed significantly to GDP growth last year. The country's GDP for 2022 is almost 228 billion newtom. The report also states that within the GDCF, the construction sector grew by almost 10%. 2022 saw almost 50 billion newtom invested in the construction sector. According to the report, the rise in construction investment was attributed to increased government spending on construction projects and relaxation of pandemic protocols in the construction sector. Meanwhile, a decline in the export of goods and services and a marked increase in the import of goods and services have led to the country's trade deficit increasing by almost 100% last year compared to 2021. According to National Accounts Statistics, trade deficit for last year is almost 80 billion newtom, which is an increase from about 40 billion in 2021. The country imported goods and services worth about 140 billion newtom last year, while exporting goods and services about 60 billion newtom, leading to a substantial increase in trade deficit. The trade deficit accounts for about 35% of the GDP. With camera person Doji Siring, this is Sherab Doji, BBS News. Bhutan imported over 30 billion items worth of goods and services in the first three months of 2023. According to the Finance Ministry's Bhutan Trade Statistics report for the first quarter, the import figure is three times that of the country's export, which stands at about 10 billion items. The first quarter also saw about 1.5 billion yetum worth of electricity imports, while almost 3 billion worth of ferro alloys were exported during the same period. After 2022 saw a trade deficit of almost 80 billion yetum, the trend of widening gap between import and export is expected to continue, as the first three months of this year saw a trade deficit of 22 billion yetum. The import bill consists largely of high-speed diesel, which accounted for 2.5 billion item of the total imports from January to March. Among the top 10 imports, petrol worth over 850 million item was imported, while over 750 million item was spent on importing rice. Similarly, according to the Bhutan Trade Statistics, almost 650 million yetum worth of smartphones and 560 million yetum worth of vaccines for humans were imported. As for exports, trade statistics show that over 5 billion yetum worth of base metals and articles for base metals were exported in the first three months of this year. Now these base metals are common non-precious metals used in various industries. Mineral products made up of over 2.5 billion yetum of exports, while close to 1 billion yetum worth of vegetables were exported. Additionally, prepared foodstuffs, beverages, 
vinegar, tobacco, and other consumables of over 450 million yetam were exported between January and March. With India being Bhutan's largest trade partner, it is no surprise that out of total imports of 30 billion yetam, over 23 billion yetam were imported from India. This is followed by 3 billion yetam from Singapore and 2 billion yetam from Hong Kong and China combined. On the other hand, majority of Bhutan's exports went to India and Bangladesh, with about 7 billion yetam and over 1 billion yetam respectively. With camera person Gunzang, Tashiangdun, PBS News. A recent study by the Asian Development Bank, ADB, shows that the performance of classes 10 and 12 students during the COVID-19 pandemic was relatively strong compared with other countries at a similar level of economic development. The research found that the performance gap between students who were financially stronger and those who had financial problems did not widen unlike in other countries. Test scores of almost 7,000 students in Zonka and English subjects were compared before and after the COVID-19 pandemic for the study. The ADB research found that only 16% of students had at least one parent with a higher secondary education. This suggests that many students might have faced difficulty getting academic support at home. The study also found that 42% of the students surveyed had a computer at home, but the coverage of television and mobile phones was much higher at 89% and 98% respectively. The study also found that 40% of the surveyed students were in schools without boarding facilities. The research points out how necessary it was to offer a range of remote or online learning solutions to these students. According to an economist with the ADB Millen Thomas, who carried out the research, additional boarding facilities provided by the government as an immediate response to the students helped prevent learning loss. What was unique to this COVID period is that we find that students who studied in boarding schools were uh, better performing than students who stayed at home. And this was especially true for students who would have faced difficult learning envir environments if they had stayed at home. There's already a long history of relying on boarding schools to provide education for all. So what happened during COVID-19 is that those same boarding schools that had been a key pillar of the secondary school education system were able to step up and uh, provide a protected learning environment to even more students. He also added that the research was done in order to understand the education system during the COVID-19 pandemic. If you look at other countries uh, where the COVID-19 pandemic was most disruptive, you typically see that the gaps between the most advantaged students and the most disadvantaged students grew even larger uh, during school closures. In our new ADB study, we find that that's actually not the case uh, in Bhutan. However, the research suggests that school closures during the pandemic were most likely damaging for younger students who were less prepared for the online instruction and had experienced a longer period of school closure in the country. This is Sonam Yudan for BBS News. In the last six years, Bhutan has seen a rapid decline in the rice self-sufficiency ratio. From 47% in 2018, the country's rice self-sufficiency rate has dropped to 25.5% in 2022 to 2023 fiscal year. However, the Department of Agriculture says this drop in self-sufficiency ratio coupled with India limiting the export of rice to 79,000 tons per year for Bhutan will not affect the availability of rice in the market for Bhutanese consumers. Upon request from the Bhutanese government, India recently announced it will allow export of limited quantity and of non-Basmati white rice to Bhutan, considering the friendly relation between the two countries. The country banned the export in July to ensure easy availability and to reduce price hike in its domestic market. Multiple factors contribute to variations in the country's rice self-sufficiency ratio. These include the amount of rice imported, the volume of rice produced domestically, 
and the nation's consumption patterns. The country imported close to 90,000 tons of rice last year. Meanwhile, rice farmers across the country produced around 30,000 tons during the same period. However, one key factor the officials say in the decline is the decreasing interest in paddy cultivation among Bhutanese farmers. The country's land under rice cultivation is reportedly decreasing by hundreds of acres every year. Area is getting reduced every year by at least 400 to 500 acres. That only indicates that farmers are uh, not that interested to go for paddy in general. Uh, and uh, that we can uh, basically uh, understand that the rice is not economically viable. He added that while it is impossible to achieve 100% rice self-sufficiency, the ministry is trying to attain a minimum self-sufficiency rate, targeting a range of 30 to 35%. The country has a total arable land of about 90,000 hectares or more than 200,000 acres. However, only 2.7% of it can be used for rice cultivation. He also added that the extensive investment of time and resources that goes into paddy cultivation makes it impractical to try and achieve 100% rice self-sufficiency. It's simply not possible uh, in our context to meet all the rice requirement to be produced domestically. By the area, by the... Uh, uh, investment uh, by the uh, inputs that are available like water and other, you know, and we have a lot of conflicts with the human wildlife. The ministry says while they cannot force people to cultivate paddy, they are trying to enhance the production among those cultivating rice by introducing innovative methods such as spring paddy cultivation and climate resilient agriculture. Karmasam Tanwangda for BBS News. The Office of the Attorney General is reviewing a case on alleged abuse of power by two former ministers from the previous government for awarding contract directly to a contractor. The office received the case from the Anti-Corruption Commission more than a week ago. Since the case is under review, the office did not share any details. Meanwhile, the People's Democratic Party said the former ministers did not abuse power or violate procurement rules. The accused ministers are Doji Chudan, the former minister of the Erstwhile Works and Human Settlement Ministry, and Namgi Doji, the former finance minister. The ministers said that a contractor was carrying out road widening works in Trongsa in 2015. They said that the contract period was for a year but after five months, the contractor faced difficulty in widening the road due to rugged terrain at Songkhalum. By that time, 30% of the work was completed. <laughs> The rugged terrain stretched around 500 meters. The road widening work was further hampered by the monsoon. We could not blast the rocks since they posed a danger to the settlements of the Mangduchu hydropower project. Furthermore, since commuters traveled daily, it was risky for them. <laughs> It is in accordance with the procurement rules and regulations of 2019 that the Finance Ministry approved the direct award of work for pavement construction. It had also posed risk to human safety and risk of economic loss to the Mandichu hydropower project. According to the ministers, since the Zonkalum work was deemed risky, the contract was surrendered on mutual understanding between the government and the contractor. The ministers added that in place of the surrendered work at Zonkalum, the contractor was given contract to construct pavements of around 3 kilometers from Nobding to Dungdung Nessa in Wangdifodrang. The issue came into the limelight in the annual audit report 2019. According to the report, the erstwhile Department of Roads directly gave construction of pavements from Nobding to Dungdung Nesa to the contractor resulting in financial implications for the government. The report states that this violates the procurement rules. 
According to the report, the Ministry of Finance had approved the direct award of work for the pavement construction, based on a proposal submitted by the Works and Human Settlement Minister. Meanwhile, the ministers added that additional works carried out by the contractor for the package in Trongsa were not highlighted in the audit report. PBS contacted the Anti-Corruption Commission and the Royal Audit Authority, but they did not share any information regarding the case. Tashiangdin, PBS News. With the Royal Civil Service Commission conducting the preliminary examination in Mongar, it has become easier for graduates residing in the eastern part of the country as they do not have to travel to Tempo. Now they are requesting if they can have the document verification center opened in the east too. Once they pass the exam, the graduates have to travel to Tempo for document verification for the main examinations. Around 190 graduates set for preliminary examination in Monga and from that, 120 passed the exam. Some graduates who came from the East for document verification said they are facing difficulties as it incurs huge expenses in traveling to Thimpu. I am from Tashka. After passing the PE, I came to Thimpu for document verification. It was difficult to get a ride to reach here. Moreover, it was risky as there are ongoing road widening works between Sengor and Numling. Upon reaching here, I had to search for a house and pay rent. I do not have any relatives residing here. I feel like it would be easier if there is the RCSC branch office in the east. Some others raised the need to ease document verification process. Some of them took to social media requesting the RCSC to start accepting documents online. But Royal Civil Service Commission said as of now, they have no plans to conduct document verification in the East. They said that document verification requires a team of officials for each category and it is costly to travel to the East for over a hundred graduates. Officials said the Commission could start the preliminary examination in the East as it requires a few invigilators. Officials from the Commission added that they announced the schedule for the main examinations, including the date of document verification in June, to provide sufficient time for preparation. Document verification for the main examinations started last week and it ended today. More than 2,000 graduates will appear at the main examinations in October. This is the Kilhazum for BBS News. A team of four judokas represented at the Thailand International Judo Championship 2023 in preparation for the 19th Asian Games, which will begin later this month in Hangzhou, China. The judokas managed to bag a silver and a bronze medal at the championship. Despite the recent success, the judokas are now focused for the Asian Games. Three judokas will represent Bhutan at the Games. Kilitering bagged the silver medal in the 66 kg category at the Thailand International Judo Championship, while Lee Shin Yirup won the bronze medal in the 55 kg category. Meanwhile, Ngong Namgil lost a closely fought match with his opponent from the Philippines in the 60 kg category. Tandun Wong Chuk competing in the 73 kg category could not win a medal but won two games out of four. The team was led by Japanese coach Yuki Fukui. This tournament is uh, we got a uh, uh, good results. We prepared uh, this tournament uh, so many things. Uh, uh, stamina training, muscle training, and uh, judo techniques also. And we went to the training camp in the uh, India. Including Bhutan, 12 other Asian countries participated in the championship. It is my second time representing Bhutan on an international level. I feel that getting a medal is not as important as being able to represent the country. The challenge we face is that we are not able to find training partners as the number of athletes is less, which affects our training as well. 
Yishinyurup added that the lack of training partners makes it difficult to train efficiently and hinders the process of building their stamina and strength. For judo, they like at competition level, high level. The Asian Games for Judo is highly competitive, as more athletes are Asian Olympians from Korea, Japan and Uzbekistan. So winning might be difficult, but we hope to finish in the top 10. Like Kennedy, Lahatown, like top 10, Amchinadi, Hesinik, Dry Benila. The athletes train for four hours every day except on Sundays and Wednesday mornings. Their training includes gym workouts, running, and judo training focused on their techniques and forms. Tsring Diki for BBS News. That is it for this week. Do join us next week as well. Thank you for watching. Take care and goodbye.